So we knew that looking at this case, that Karen was actually wrong about the door. But you know what? The jury still found her to be reliable as a witness, even though she was wrong about the door. Why? Because jurors are instructed, in California at least, I'm sure it's probably true here too, by judges, who basically tell them that, you know, witnesses can sometimes be wrong, but they can still be reliable. Do not automatically reject testimony just because of inconsistencies or conflicts. Consider whether the differences are important or not. People sometimes honestly forget things or make mistakes about what they remember. Also, two people may witness the same event yet see or hear it differently. You think? Or the Gospels? Just because there is something that appears to be an error in Karen's testimony, if we can explain why she might be wrong about it because she was so nervous seeing the car parked there, panicking, not sure what she was going to see when she opened the door, I get it. I can understand why she was panicking, okay? I get it. And because of that, I can remove that one piece and still find her reliable. So to the skeptic who says, well, how do I know what's reliable and what's not reliable in the scripture? Okay, let's just do a little exercise together. Let's take the verses that we discovered in this chapter of John, and even though there's only one word is sometimes contested, let's cut out the entire sentence in which those words exist. Okay, and just to be fair, that doesn't satisfy you? Well, go ahead and pick out another 25%. Now, I won't be picky about what I ask you to keep. Don't you be picky about what you take out. Let's just take out every fourth line. Okay, 25% taken out looks kind of like this. Tell you what, we'll be generous. Maybe we're wrong. Let's go ahead and take out every other line. Let's take out 50% of the text. Looks like this. Wow, what if you were to find a way, what if some evidence came to bear that said we should take out 50% of our scripture? Would that shake you up? Wouldn't shake me up. You'd still have a reliable story about Jesus. Would there be some questions to ask? Of course. But for the most part, this wouldn't bother me because even taking out every other line, you still know enough to know is Jesus who he said he was? What did he say? What did he do? You still know enough. Not only that, you could go back and compare the other texts the other Gospels, and see if they fill in the data that's missing from John. And you would find they probably do. But not only that, you could go to the people who John taught, just his students. He had three students, Polycarp, Ignatius, and Papias. You could go to Paul's students if you want to look at Paul's letters. He had Clement. These people wrote about what it was their teachers taught them. So if you just added back the early church fathers, you would fill in now all the gaps that you abandoned and pulled out arbitrarily. So in the end, you'd have a text. By the way, if you just looked at the writing, if you lost all of the scripture, lost 100% of it, and all you had was the writing of the students of John, the student of Paul, what would you know about Jesus? What would you know about his life? Do you realize these people wrote their letters, seven letters by Ignatius to the local churches, one letter to uh, the, the, Philipp, uh, the Philippi church by Polycarp. Clement wrote a letter. And in those letters, they refer to or quote from all of the gospels. They refer to or quote from or allude to most of the letters. And the Jesus described by this first generation of witnesses, no, but not witnesses, of students of the eyewitnesses, if you ask them, what did these folks teach you about Jesus? And you lost all of the gospels. Here's what you know about Jesus. In terms of his life, you would know a lot of detail. You'd know that he was born of a virgin. You'd know that he was, all this stuff. The essential details of Jesus' life would still be intact just by reading what the first generation of students tell you was taught to them by the gospel writers. Well, what about uh, whether he was resurrected or not? I have a list in the book, it's a whole chapter, just a list of every reference to the person of Jesus by the students of the gospel writers. When it comes to the actual resurrection, all the details of the resurrection are repeated by the students who are quoting the work of John, quoting the teaching of John, quoting Paul, Clement quoting, quoting, quoting Paul. What about the deity of Christ? Is that like a late, a late edition also? How can I be sure that that's actually in the Bible? Because the students of the gospel writers also wrote about the deity of Christ. All the things that matter to you about Christ's deity, what we call him, Savior, Lord, God, how we're saved, what Christ's work on the cross does for us in saving, that we're saved only by the grace of God. All of this is in the writing 
of the students of the gospel writers. The stuff that Bart Ehrman would hate is affirmed by the very first set of students that Jesus is a miracle worker who claimed to be God, who proved his deity by rising from the dead. That's being taught by the students who sat and listened to what John said. So if you think you've got an error in John's gospel, you could at least look at his student. What's his student say, he said? You're stuck with this former Jesus. Jesus. 